All right, hello once again. This is Jeff Scott of Rankin Technical College, and I've been going over the PowerPoint slides for Web Development and Design Foundations with HTML5, 8th edition by Terry Felk Morris. There are 14 chapters in the book, and I am up to chapter 6, which is on page layout and CSS positioning. In an earlier chapter, I had talked about the CSS box model. We're now going to look at it in a little bit more depth and breadth of coverage. We'll talk about margins with CSS, how to float things with CSS, different types of positioning, those being fixed, relative, and absolute, how to create a two-column page layout using CSS, and I believe in the next chapter we'll go through a three-column layout, how to configure navigation in unordered lists and style them with CSS. How to add interactivity to hyperlinks with CSS pseudo classes. And finally, how to start bringing in some of these HTML5 structural elements, things like section tags, article tags, and side tags. All right. <clears throat> so here's the box model. It's also in your textbook on page... 248 and when we look at that the content is the thing in the middle and that's basically that's what it is you want to show it could be a paragraph it could be a, some kind of a tag you know a h1 header tag it could be something else right after the content right after the content you have padding so as it says the content is there than the padding. So the padding exists between the content and the border. The border exists between the padding and the margin. And the margin is the space between different elements. You can get drastically looking, different looking um, <clears throat> information by going and making changes to padding versus making changes to margin. You're going to see some of that as we go on. Now, with the margin property, it consists of four things. And as we talked about before, it's like a clock. So you've got the, the, the top, the right, the bottom, and the left. Now, if you specify them, and you put in margin top, margin right, margin left, margin bottom, etc. If you literally list all four of them, or if you're only using one of them, or if you're only using two of them, or if you're only using three of them, but you don't say margin, you say margin top and or margin right and or margin left and or margin bottom, the order in which you say them doesn't matter. On the other hand, if you just say margin, this says a zero margin for top, bottom, left, and right. This says a 20 pixel margin for top and bottom and a 10 pixel margin for left and right. This one I'll have to go back and check because I don't remember. And this would be a 20 pixel top, 30 pixel right, zero pixel bottom, 30 pixel left. Now, padding works pretty much the same way. But again, as mentioned, padding is the empty space between the content of the element and its border, whereas the margin is the empty space between the element and the element next to it. So here's an example when you look at it. They call this the box model in action. This is the bottom of page 249 in the book. So you can see that the margin lies outside of the element itself. The border is inside of the element itself. The border is kind of the tipping point between the margin and the padding. And then there's the content. All right, so those are a couple of examples. CSS, as mentioned here, has a box sizing property. One thing to realize is we're looking at everything that you put in CSS. It, it Basically, everything goes inside of a box, even if it doesn't look like it. 
So there's a default value for the width and the height of all content. And the default width is the value for the content, not including its border and not including its padding. But as it says right there on the slide, the box sizing property is used to select or to direct the browser to calculate the width and the height. If you want to apply it to everything, the asterisk is a universal, sim is a universal symbol for everything. Now, if we look in here, notice the difference between these. In the first case, we've got two boxes, and they're disjoint from one another. That's what they call the normal flow. So you've got the first box, whatever the content would be in here. Then you've got the second box down below it. In the second case, you're embedding the inner box within the outer box. But the normal flow says browser displays elements in the order they're coded in a document. Now, if you want to not adhere to the normal flow, you can use what's called the float property to make something appear to float on the left or the right side, either on the left or right side of the browser window. Notice we've got it floating over here. Or between two different elements. You've got to watch it because once you start telling stuff to float left like this, then everything will keep floating left until you do what's called a clear. And when you clear, you've got three choices. You can clear left, you can clear right, or you can clear both. So when you look at the example, if we had done a float left here, now you can see what happens. But if we do a clear left before we do this, that takes the float away and you can see what happens. This is hopefully going to make much more sense when we start looking at this in more depth and breadth of coverage. All right. Hopefully you've heard the saying in life at some time about trying to put, trying to shove 10 pounds worth into a five pound bag. Well, the reason that I'm bringing that up is it sort of has to do with the overflow property. And as mentioned right there, the overflow property is intended to configure the display of elements on a web page. Its values are auto, hidden, and scroll. Now, typically, when you have something and you set it to auto, what happens is the whatever area that you have for something will expand or extend to show all of it. If you've got something hidden, it'll only show in the area that you've allotted for it, and the rest will literally be hidden. And there won't be any scroll bar. <clears throat> if you put scroll, the excess content will be hidden, but a horizontal and or vertical scroll bar will be added as necessary. Now, the display property is an interesting one. As it says, it configures how and if an element is displayed. And you'll notice we've got display none, display block, display inline, and display inline block. This will become more important as we start to position things on a web page, and the inline and the block, etc., will be more important when we start looking at things like forms later on. When you've got display none, it says the element will not be displayed. It's still there, but for lack of better words, it's invisible. It's still there. It's still taking up space on the page. When you say display block, the element is rendered as a block element, even if it's an inline statement like a hyperlink. Since it's rendered as a block element, it will automatically have a blank line before it and a blank line after it. If you say display inline, <clears throat> as it says in that case, the element will be rendered as an inline element, even if it's not actually an inline element. Now, this will become important when we start to create navigation 
and you want right along the top here, for example, you want your um, menu to have everything all on one line. And finally, there's display inline block, where it's kind of a combination. And as it says, the element will display as an inline display element adjacent to other inline display elements, but can also be configured with block display properties, like width and height. Again, it probably won't make a boatload of sense until you start to see all of this in action. All right, so let's start talking a little bit about layout. In the example on the left, you see a single column layout. Everything is in one column. When we're talking columns, we're not talking rows. There's one, two, three, four rows here. There's four rows, but there's only one column. All right, so that would be like a four by one array, for example. Here, we've got one column here and one column here, but in our content area, we have two columns. So typically, as mentioned right there, when you set this up, one way that you could do it would be to use this here as a nav. Okay, <clears throat> so that would be your menu over here and that would be your content. That's more old school. And what I mean is, most of the time today, you see a one column layout with something like this, where the nav is shown here as opposed to here. Now they show here how you would have and set up a basic type of two column layout. You'll notice you've got a wrapper here. All right. And the wrapper, to my knowledge, is going to pretty much hold everything. Margin left auto and margin right auto, which means center things on the page. We've got a background color. Then we've got a header area that's got its own background color. We've got a nav area that's going to float left, so it's way to the left. A width of 90 pixels. A padding of 10 pixels all the way around. Then we've got a main area that's right in here. And the main area will have a left margin of 100 pixels. 10 pixels of padding all the way around it. A background color of white. Finally, at the bottom, we'll have our footer. The text will be center aligned, will be italic, and the footer will be the same color, basically, as the header is, which is off times done. Here, <clears throat> now previously, you saw the nav, which was kind of sandwiched between the header and the footer but it didn't extend into the header area or into the footer area, here it does. Now what used to be in vogue was to have vertical navigation on a web page, something that looked more or less like what you see on the screen here. Whether it had the underlines and whether or not it had the uh, bullets or not. <clears throat> So in the first example, we're just creating something very simplistic here. In fact, we should be able to grab this. Should be the opportune word here. But let's try it. So I'm going to grab all of this. why it's not showing, but it's not allowing me to do anything here. Okay, that's fine. Let's, let's come in and do it this way. So I'm just going to, for lack of better words, I'm going to grab a bunch of the stuff that's here, and let's put it up near the top, because that's typically where it would go. So let's put it right at the beginning of our body section here. So we're going to have a nav area. Since we have a beginning nav, we'll have an ending nav. All right. And we'll have a UL. So since we have a beginning UL, we'll need an ending UL. And we're going to have four LIs in here. 
here where it's going to be copy good. So there's our four LIs. Okay, let's see what that ends up looking like. Okay, so we now have this at the top. Home, menu, directions, and contact. Now, they're not going to go anywhere. They're not going to go anywhere because we haven't told them to. So let's put some CSS in here and then go back and let's look at the CSS. Come on. All right. So we'll come in. <clears throat> now I'll bring up the CSS file. And we've been going down here, so nav, ul, And we're saying list, list, style, type, none. Let's see if we just put in that and nothing else, how this changes, if at all. Okay, so that got rid of the dots, just so you can see what's happening there. All right, so that's the first thing. Nav A. Now we want to say text decoration none. Okay. And I'm just going to do each one of these individually so you can see what's happening. So the first one, we remove the dots. Right now it doesn't look like we did anything. In fact, now that I look at it, with the first one, the list style type, none. Let, let's, go, let's go back and let's take this thing we just put in here and let's, let's comment it out. Save. Come back and run this again. Oh, I'm surprised. Because I would have thought we would have still had our underlines unless we did something earlier in our CSS where we did a text decoration none, which is possible. I'm not sure if we did that or not. There was the there was the text decoration none. That's why we have that. So let's get let's take that and comment that out. All right, this is again what we had put in earlier. So I'm removing that. All right, and now you'll notice we've got the underlines again. All right, so let's take it from the top because I didn't want to confuse anyone. I'm going back down here and I'm going to take everything that's in here and I'm going to comment it out and then I'm going to bring it back in again. All right, so what we had originally was this. We had the underlines and we had the bullets. Then what we said was, okay, what we want you to do is for each one of these LIs, for each one, we want you to remove the bullet list, the, the dots, whatever you want to call it. So we did that. And that resulted in this. But we still have the underlines. Then we came back in and we said text decoration none. And that should at least remove those underlines and it does all right then finally we want to go back and we want to say oh, two more things i guess padding right 10 pixels what we're doing is we're making it look a little more aesthetically pleasing so padding right 10 pixels what does that do watch how this gets pushed over Right? Doesn't really show too much, but it is being moved over. Finally, let's go to our nav LIs. And what we're going to say for the nav LIs is display inline. So we put in 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 lines of CSS. And look at how different it looks. Now we could change the color of this, but what we have, rather than an unordered list with bullets, is we have an unordered list which is showing in a horizontal arrangement rather than in a vertical arrangement. It does not have the bullets in front of it, and we've removed the underline. All right, this looks much more like what you typically see on a website. Now, there are also pseudo classes. I'm going to grab each one of these. And two things about them. First of all, notice there's link, which is the default state for hyperlink. So it's, it's when the link first gets put out there. Visited means that you have clicked on the link at least once. So you visited it. Focus is when you put your mouse on it. Hover is when you move over it. And active is during the time it's being clicked. So let's see. I don't know. But let's see if I grab this, or can I grab this? Why it's not letting me grab these things? All right, but it's not. So let's, let's go and put these in manually. A colon link. Again, these are called pseudo classes. Color, pound sign. 000066. So that's going to be some version of blue. Is it going to look different? Let's see. All right. Now it's a navy blue as opposed to what you saw before. So there's the first one. Then we've got visited. I'm just going to copy this, make my changes to it. So that will be visited, and the color here will be 003366. All right, is that important? Let's look. So it doesn't look any different here, but notice once I click something and come back, all right, it's at least supposed to look a little bit different. Now, it's, it's a little funky because I don't actually have pages set up with this stuff. All right. We've got focus, which looks like it's red. What does that do? Notice how when I click on it there, how it turned red. Okay. couple more. We've got hover, which means when I take my mouse and hover over it, You can see how when I'm hovering over something, how the color is changing. And finally, we've got active, which should be while it's being clicked. All right. Now, they've got red for this, and we've already seen red before, but that's fine. So let's see if while this is being clicked, it goes red. And you can see that it does. All right. I do believe that the order in which you do these matters. In other words, it has to be an order of link, visited, focus, hover, and active. You don't have to choose any of these, and you can choose any combination. But they must be done in this order. Anything that you don't choose will naturally have a default value. All right. 
So hyperlinks are underlined by default. Here what we're saying is they should be red. And here we're saying when you hover over them, not only should they be red, in fact not red, be some version of blue, but have the underlines go away when you hover over them. So there's all sorts of different things that you can do for this. All right. Header text image replacement. Useful when a non-web safe font must be used in the header logo banner area. Display the banner image, but also configure the text in the H1 for use of, by search engines and assistive technologies. Well, what's important here when they start talking about things like search engines is remember, search engines are going to imply sooner or later search engine ranking. And you want to make sure that, for instance, let's say you have a sporting goods store. In an ideal world, you want your sporting goods store, when somebody does a Google search on sporting goods stores, to be on the first page. So you want to do everything that you can do to try to move yourself up in the search engine rankings. Plus, with assistive technologies, this is one way you can do that because the easier you make it for people to use and the bigger the audience you make it useful for, there is some kind of a uh, formula that search engines use as far as ranking. No one knows exactly what it is, but the stuff you see here like using these assistive technologies will help in that. All right. When you position something on a page, there's four ways that you can do it. Static is if you do nothing. It's the default value. Elements are put basically the way that you put them on the page. Fixed. Sometimes you see this that somebody, for example, you might take your navigation bar that we just built and you might make it fixed. Now, when we look right here, at what we were just doing, all right, notice that right there, see that, how that disappears? You may or may not want that to even be allowed to happen. So if you set it up as fixed, as it says, it configures the location of an element within the browser's viewport. It does not move when the page is scrolled. When something is relative, it configures the location of the element relative to where it would otherwise render in normal flow. An absolute basically says it is in an absolute position. So as we look at these, fixed positioning. Navigation stays play in place. All right. So let's try that, see if we can do something with it. I don't know if this will work or not. just nav oops, position fixed. So let's take that line of code, this nav position fixed, let's copy it and let's try to put it into our CSS. And you'll notice I'm putting a line break in here. You don't have to do that. I do it because for me it makes it a little easier to read things when they're separated like this. So now I've got nav position fixed. Did that do anything? Well, we'll have to check. So let's refresh our page. All right, there it is. And notice now it's not moving. Now that looks kind of ugly, but you get the idea that now our navigation bar is not moving. We could do some workarounds here where we work with margin and padding to put it up here and it you know nothing would scroll where it would stay in the same spot but all the other stuff would basically scroll down below it okay all right so that was fixed there's relative positioning it says changes in the location of an element in relation to where it would otherwise appear in the normal flow. All right, so here is an example. The paragraph uses relative positioning to be placed 30 pixels from the left-hand side. Again, let's keep just keep trying these. So instead of P, I'm going to have a class for that. So I'm going to come in here and where it says paragraphs, because that would reposition all paragraphs. Let's have a class, and we'll call it 
rel pause for relative positioning. All right, and we're telling its position to be relative. We want it left 30 pixels, and we want the font family to be Arial. Okay, if you can't find Arial, make it a sans serif. So we've got rel pause. Now that's not going to do a flaming thing until we come in and in one of these paragraphs, we've got to set its, let's take the second one here because that's a full paragraph. So class is colorful, but let's also add to that rel pause. All right. So it should be this second paragraph right here. And you may or may not have noticed, but it now moved over 30 pixels. And we changed the type of the font that we were using. All right, so that's relative positioning. All right. Next, we have absolute positioning, which says basically, all right, we, we want this outside of the normal flow. So again, I think it makes the most sense to just keep grabbing this stuff and putting it in here. So to me, this is how you learn. So I'm going to put this in. And again, not a paragraph. We're going to make another one. We'll call it ABS pause for absolute positioning. And again, where before we said position relative, now we're saying position absolute. That's the important part. Let's take the first paragraph that we have in here, which is that small paragraph that's got once upon a time, and let's set the class, remember to save, to absolute positioning, or abs pause. So that was the first paragraph that we put in there. That's right. There it is, once upon a time. All right. So for this paragraph, we're going to say class equal apps pause. All right. So it's the first paragraph, so you should be able to see something right away. It's this paragraph here. Well, did we do it correctly? equals apps pause. We saved. Apps pause. Let's try changing the font to something more crazy. Uh, fantasy. All right, let's make a width of 100 pixels. We'll make it left 400 pixels, and from the top, we'll make it 200 pixels. I'm really changing a bunch of the stuff here. It does not appear as though it worked. There it is. Notice how it's not moving now. It's in the same position. It's a little weird, but just so you see what's going on. All right, let's go back and rechange back to what we had to begin with here. there it is so it's absolutely it's in an absolute position on the screen it's not relative to where everything else is on the screen it's absolutely right there now sometimes you end up using a combination of these things when you're building a web page all right okay as we are working our way toward the end of the chapter here. You, when you're debugging CSS, sometimes you can just manually look at it and figure out what's wrong. Sometimes you've got to go to the validator. Sometimes what you want to do is you want to configure temporary background colors. So what you might want to do is you might want to, if I'm having a problem with a, with a paragraph, I might want to put that paragraph in a div, change the color of that div, 
and I might have, if I've got five paragraphs, I might have each one in its own colored div so I can work with it. If the divs don't work, I can add borders. I can add comments to comment things in, comment things out. Here's a key one. Don't expect your pages to look exactly the same in all browsers. They won't. IE is infamous for looking different than other browsers. Be patient. Sometimes the best thing to do when you're, walk, when you're working with this stuff is to literally walk away for a couple of minutes. All right, compose yourself, go out, have a, have a soda, and come back. All right, last thing, reviewing some of the HTML5 structural elements. A header, block display, contains headings of a web page. All right, typically they'll have things like a tagline, a logo, or whatever. The nav we've already looked at is typically either going to be vertical or what's in more in vogue today is going to be horizontal, and that's your menu bar, for lack of better words. The main element is where you have your main page content, and the footer element is down at the bottom of the page. There are other elements, and a side, as it says, it's kind of like a sidebar. Maybe you've seen this before, where, let's, let's suppose, for example, um, that somebody gets elected to office. So that's the, you know, it's in a small town, so the main story on the, in the local paper the next day is so-and-so gets elected to office. Jane Smith gets elected mayor. And they've got a big article on it. And then along the side, they've got an, another smaller article that chronicles Jane Smith's life. That would be an aside. All right? Sections and articles are interesting because the section, as it says, it's sort of like a chapter or a topic of a book. Typically, articles appear in sections. Some people have sections inside of articles, so it can get a little confusing. But you can see the different definitions there. And the time element, as it says, can be useful if you're working with a blog because you always want to make sure you've got the, the, the latest and greatest on top. All right? HTML5 compatibility with older browsers. Sometimes you put things like this on the top, which just says, hey, if you don't know what these tags are, just display them block. Don't worry about it. This is called, they call it an HTML5 shim. I've always known it as an HTML5 shiv. What this says, basically, is if you're using Internet Explorer that's less than version 9, all right, and you don't understand what a tag is, basically just ignore it. Now, I'm being very general there, but that's pretty much what it is. Deciding whether something should be a class or an ID. If you need more than one of them on a page, it should be a class. So if I wanted to be able to take many paragraphs on a page and make them red and do different things with them, I'd make, the, I'd make a class for it. If it was something that was just going to apply to a footer and I only had one footer on a page, I'd make it an ID. So applying it to more than one element on a page, class. Only one element on a page, ID. Classes use the dot in the style sheet. IDs use the pound sign. Classes, when you set them up, uses the class attribute, so class equals. IDs equal, use the ID attribute, so ID equal. So in this chapter, as we come to the close here, we briefly went over the CSS box model. We talked a little bit about some of the differences between margin and float. I'm sorry, between margin and padding. We looked at how to float things, and we're going to look at these in more depth and breadth of coverage as we go on. I showed you examples of fixed positioning, relative positioning, and absolute positioning. We looked at how you set up a two-column page layout. We also looked at a single-column page layout, for that matter. We looked at how you take a navigation and set it up as an unordered list with bullets and with hyperlinks, and by using about... 10 lines of CSS, we A, removed the bullets, B, removed the underlines, and C, instead of making it a vertical list, we made it a horizontal list. We talked about adding interactivity to hyperlinks using these pseudo classes and the order in which they must be put. And we ended the chapter by looking, starting to look at some of the HTML5 specific structural elements. All right and in particular, section, article, and aside. That's it for this chapter.
for the next chapter, we will be going over chapter 7. In chapter 7, that is in our book and starts in our book on page 307, we will continue a discussion of links, layout, and mobile. Now we'll look at a three-column layout. All right, we'll look a little more at sprites and a few other things, some of which we've discussed before, some of which will be brand new. And I'll be back with that lecture very shortly.